Over the past decade, the craft beer industry has boasted some pretty impressive feats of growth. It seems like every time I turn a corner, I'm discovering another new amazing tap room. There are nearly 7,500 craft breweries in the U.S. 1,000 opened in 2018 alone. Those breweries now directly employ over 150,000 Americans and affect well over half a million jobs. Small breweries boasted $76 billion in sales in 2018, an 11% increase over 2016, with 5% overall sales growth in that same year. The trend is no different here. There were 35 craft breweries in Minnesota in 2011, when the Surly Law was passed. Today, we're approaching 200. That is some amazing growth in this industry over a very short period of time. The Twin Cities are the epicenter for Minnesota craft breweries. There are so many new and iconic tap rooms here that it can be overwhelming, even for beer lovers. We'll be getting intimate with a handful of them over the course of this series. And with so many legendary destinations to choose from, there's no way we can go wrong. So gather around the bar with me as I talk to these incredibly talented brewers about how this stuff is made. We're gonna find out what all this hype is about and get to the bottom of a few cold ones. Let's all make a toast to the craft. Today we are headed to Modest Brewing Company. We're in the North Loop of Minneapolis. Along with the rebranding of this neighborhood, Target Field brought in a whole new wave of condos and commerce to the area. So this part of town is always hopping with new restaurants and bars and things to do. Modest is situated among a bunch of notable neighbor breweries. So it really helps cultivate the identity of this neighborhood. Modest opened in April of 2016. And in that short time, they've made waves regionally and nationally for the amazing work that they do. And we're gonna find out what that's all about. The definition of modest is a person who modifies. It's also a brewery in the North Loop. What's really special about this place is that they push past traditional brewing boundaries by relying on creativity and unbridled experimentation to create a really new experience for their guests. Word on the street is, they have a piece of equipment that allows them to make impossible beers. We're gonna find out how. Me. Hi, I'm Diana. Good to meet you. Oh, Welcome. Good to meet you too. Thank you so much. Wow, there is so much to see as soon as you walk in. I'm looking at awards and of course the tanks and these incredible murals. Can you talk to me about the art I'm seeing here in the tap room? Yeah, um, we like to uh, keep wide open walls uh, so that we can showcase different art. We have rotating art that comes here through local artists, but also we work with um, local artists as well to do murals, to do big more installations that we just kind of collect over the years. Um, we have a few more walls to fill, but there'll be definitely more and more art as we go on. It's just to keep it, that creative space flowing. Absolutely. And anything we should know about the tap room itself and the design aspects of it? Sure. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do is, uh, as you come into the brewery, you want to make you feel uh, that you're in a brewery, so that's why uh, all of our equipment's on display right there. You can get a close-up look at that, uh, but also as far as the design and layout, we wanted it to be uh, easy for traffic, um, you know, um, and then also showcase uh, the, all the different mixed materials uh, from the I-beams, the concrete, wood, and just kind of let those materials speak for themselves and keep it raw and just a nice coat of clear on everything to, to just, you know, not hiding anything. Yeah. Oh, and I bet in the summertime, this door, oh. Oh, yeah. Patio season's great. A lot of natural light I pops bet. up. It's it's pretty good. Oh. Well, can we have a look around? Yeah. OK. Good morning, Keegan. Thank Good morning. you so much for meeting with me. No problem. So how did you get into beer? Um, well, um, I was very fortunate to get in on the, the very early beginnings of Minneapolis Craft Brewing. Um, I actually didn't drink beer like 10 years ago, um, so it was very new to me. I went uh, to, there's a local uh, 
brewery that opened up in South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not around anymore, but at the time, um, you know, they were fresh, they were like three months old, they needed, they needed help, and so I was like, oh, I'll volunteer, I don't know anything about beer. And uh, I found myself there three days a week and just loving it. I was getting trained in at uh, this brewery, um, at, you know, just on the side of my free time. So I would work a 40 hour shift and then come in for like 20 extra hours a week and just learn. And uh, I quickly learned um, the ropes and became, in less than a year, became one of their brewers. Um, and just helping out, learning on the job. Um, then their brewer left. I stepped in as lead brewer, did that for two and a half years. I uh, got to a, um, uh, an educational plateau at that company, left, um, and then helped out um, Rob and Sarah at Dangerous Man Brewing Company, and I was their head brewer for three and a half years. And then with uh, support from our friends and family, our investors, um, the Dangerous Man family, uh, Modest became more real, and we started Modest. So it's been about nine and a half, ten years of professionally brewing. It's been crazy. Wow, what a story. And congratulations to you on all that hard work that got you to where you are today. Thank you. And of course, all your supporters as well. It's a lot of beer. So Absolutely, a lot fun. of beer. A lot of uh, unusual and impossible beer that you make here. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, one of the biggest um, drivers at Modest was taking beer where it hasn't been. Um, and that creativity standpoint is like the heart and soul of Modest. Um, that's why it's the name Modest as in modify. Um, so we wanted to focus the heart of the company around that, and that is the brew house, of, at least on the production side. And um, we invested in equipment that can make beer out of nearly any grain that's available to us. So I would say 90% of beer in the world is made out of barley. And there's tons of different varieties of barley. Um, but there's also other grains to be had. So wheat, um, oats, rye, spelt, um, quinoa, potatoes. Like basically if it has starch and it's accessible, we can convert that into sugar and make beer out of it. So new ingredients equal new sugars, equal new alcohols, equal new beer. So we went with that and um, it's, been, it's been awesome so far. That's incredible. And is that due to, you can, you have that creative flexibility to make all these impossible beers due to a specific piece of machinery? Is that right? Yes. Um, there, at the heart of our brew house is, um, a, it's called a mash filter. Um, it is made by a company called Mira in Belgium and they've been building them for over 120 years. Um, and usually they're giant, like bigger than a semi, or about the same size, and big, big um, macro breweries use them, or big Belgian breweries use them. Um, uh, but they've made it on a very small scale for the craft size, and that's when we jumped on it. So we were like the seventh or eighth in the US to have one of that size. Um, and so what that does is it allows us to use grains in pretty much any percentage we want to. So take um, like a, a wheat beer, um, you know, a half of ice or something, that's gonna be like 40, 45%, maybe 50% wheat. And you know, that'll be not too bad, but you know, a little more difficult than your average beer on a more traditional brew house. On ours, we can do 100% wheat, no problem. So a testament to that is one of our most popular flagship beers is our Dream Yard IPA. Um, it's brewed in the New England style, but there's no barley in that beer. That is 70% malted wheat and 30% malted oats. So that is, there's no barley in it. It is a true wheat beer and it's wheat and oat alcohol, but at the same time, it's still hopped aggressively and it's hazy and juicy and soft like a New England style, but in our own way. And, um, that was just like the tip of the iceberg of what really got us rolling here is that creativity. So. Well, with the way that you're merging science and creativity, it's sort of no wonder that you're getting recognition for doing the impossible. Definitely, I mean, people are uh, excited. Uh, customers are excited, other brewers are excited. Um, just they're like, well, what? And every we like to do a lot of collaborations as well uh, to really like wrap other breweries heads around what we can and can't do yeah. and just they get different ideas and we collaborate um, so we're, we're getting known more for collaborations and traveling to do these said collaborations as well um, 
customers are loving it as well. Um, it's really fun to, to hear the feedback on, especially with our, like a, a lot, most of our beers, what we're doing, like um, they're, the feedback's great, but one of the best ones is that they really like our IPAs, our, I, our hoppy beers, because they're not as bitter. The bitterness is really low, uh, the sweetness is low, but the, the hop aroma and flavor is very high. So it's hoppy, but it's not bitter. And so the, with all this new specialty beers, all this crazy impossible beers we're doing, it's a lot of education as well. And it's, um, it, it's day, day by day. Um, the more our customers are educated about what we're doing and how the industry is growing, the more crazy beers we can make, the more they understand, the more they enjoy it. I want to ask one more question. With your creative hat on, when you were head brewer, and you've obviously continued brewing this whole time, how do you find the inspiration to kick off a new beer? Can you tell me about that process for you? Sure. Um, I find inspiration in just raw ingredients, food, cocktails, um, desserts. Um, just, again, if there's a nice flavor out there or a cool combination you come across, I can just, you know, smell the ingredient or smell the product and taste it and be like, I can make that into a beer. And um, that, that's something I have a very good skill at is putting my, what I taste in my head into the glass. Um, a good, a really good palate helps with that. Um, if you ask my partner, she'll say, I just smell everything and it's weird, but like, I know, I want to know what it smells like. It's, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's probably going to smell and taste the same. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of creativity and a lot of inspiration comes from just foods, cocktails, desserts, any kind of produce that we, you know, that we take for granted day to day. And I, I can usually translate that into beer. Some ingredients you know, but majority, if it has sugar in it, absolutely. That's phenomenal. I think you were born to do this. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, let's go explore. Okay. back in the brewery and we're going to meet Jackson, one of the brewers, and I'll distract him with a bunch of questions. Hi, Jackson. Hi. Yeah. Diana. Nice to meet so you. So good to meet you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. There is so much to see back here and I can't wait to ask you all about it. I understand you made a beer today. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So uh, we just brewed a batch of our Dream Yard IPA. It's our flagship IPA. Uh, we brew a ton of that beer. So it, was, it went relatively quickly. We just wrapped up about Know, an hour ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a it's it's a really interesting beer when you when you think about the way that the malt is as opposed to another uh, or as a more traditional IPA, I guess. But yeah, since we have this mash filter, uh, right. it makes it easy for us to do it. Okay. Yeah. And the whole process was just today, start to finish. Yeah. So I mean, the beer isn't ready. No, the beer but... isn't ready. Um, okay. The yeast is in it. It's going to start fermenting, um, hopefully overnight. Um, okay. But uh, basically what we did today was make the wort so the sugar is accessible for the yeast to eat or metabolize and make alcohol. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to walk me through it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can check it Sounds out. Good. Yeah. After you. Cool. What happens up here, Jackson? Yeah, so this is uh, our brew house. Uh, it's a five vessel brew house. So if you kind of go down the line um, from left to right, we have a hot, t a hot liquor tank and a cold liquor tank. So those just hold hot water and cold water. Uh, the three main vessels themselves, uh, the mash mixer or mash ton, um, that's where we're gonna be mixing like almost like a, it, it sort of looks like oatmeal and converting all our uh, starch into sugar. Uh, then we move through the mash filter into the boil kettle here. Uh, pretty simple, just boils. Uh, this is usually where we're adding hops or um, we've added really weird things like gummy worms or like uh, cake, I don't know, things like that. Uh, but this, this does multiple things, but really all it's doing is boiling uh, the wort. And then the last vessel over here, which is actually just the Whirlpool, it's an independent Whirlpool, um, which is also a cool thing about this brew house. So all that is doing is spinning the wort from the boil kettle into that vessel, spinning it around like a Whirlpool motion, uh, pulling a lot of the solids out of the actual wort and settling at the bottom. And then we send it back the other way out the brew house. Wonderful. Yeah. 
That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, right. I think I'm ready to start being a home brewer. Yeah, right? It's not, it's not, <laughs> not with this setup. Well, you, you could do it. <laughs> yeah, it's not too hard. Awesome. Yeah. Shall we go down and investigate this? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's check that out. Okay. Is this the machine that I've heard so much about? Yes, yeah. Okay. This is the mash filter. So, right now it looks a little bit different than it would in operation because it's actually open right now, okay. but this is kind of, I mean, it is what makes our brewery different from every, I mean, every other brewery in the state. Um, there's a few other of them, there's a few more in the country, but I mean, they're very rare. Uh, it's a really cool piece of uh, machinery. Uh, it's, I, I guess the easiest way to, of explaining it is if you think of uh, brewing traditionally, or if you think of it like coffee, brewing traditionally on a traditional brew house would be like using a drip coffee filter. Mm -hmm. um, this is like using a French press. And so oh. you're getting the same product out, but just through a slightly different way of making it. Um, okay. Of course, you get to use a lot of different ingredients like we were talking about, but in the end, we're getting relatively the same thing um, through this, but yeah. Wow. Keegan offered me some beer, so I'm gonna go check out some of what yeah. you made. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, see ya. See ya. Keegan, we meet again, and none too soon. I'm really excited to try all of these. Where should we start? Um, our first one is our Pilsner. Uh, this is a new one that came out this week. It's called Already Bored. All right, <laughs> shall we? Yeah, cheers. I'll give it a sniff. Oh, cheers. Yeah, to the house. Can you talk about the tradition of tabling and then? Um, cheers, and then table for like respect to the bar. Um, oh. And then drink, that's, that's what I do, I don't know. This is a very chill, unassuming beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use uh, really high quality um, heritage grains in this one from um, the Czech Republic. They're malted in Germany. Um, so like literally people are dragging like plows through this malt for that old school uh, process. That one's out in stores this week. Okay. Fabulous. Um, I'm keeping this one for later. Super tasty. Definitely. Um, Dream Yard, what we're known for. Um, expect flavors of pineapple, mango, um, really soft, very aromatic, fruity. There's no fruit in this beer at all. It's just okay. from the hops. Uh, it is a wheat beer, uh, but it doesn't taste like your, um, your, you know, your, your Hefeweizens, your wit beers. Um, it doesn't have that like clove, banana, bubblegum, Belgian taste, which most people mm -hmm. Um, put together uh, with with Belgian or with wheat beers. This is just IPA, but from different types of malts. And this is the one that's won so many awards. Yes, this one is uh, our flagship. Um, we have it available year round, but this one is uh, definitely stood out for us. Um, it's a crowd favorite. Cheers. Okay, here we go. Respect to the bar. Ooh! Wow, I love that. I'm smelling definitely pineapple-y and citrus, and I'm very pleased, I, as I continue on this beer path that I'm on, I'm sort of getting my IPA legs, and I'm very pleased to know that I can come here and order an IPA, and it's not intimidating, it's very doable. Yeah, it's, um, the New England style is relatively new. Uh, it, it was just uh, two years ago uh, brought into the actual official style guideline to the uh, Brewers Association. Um, it comes from the East Coast, but it's the, the point of it is massive amount of hop flavor, very hoppy, very ar ar aromatic and flavorful, but the bitterness is extremely low, and that's bringing on a whole nother um, group of people or beer lovers that don't touch IPAs or pale ales or double IPAs because they're too bitter and it has that really bite. This has none of that. So we, yep. with since we brew a lot of these style of beers, we take very, our, our hop selection very, very seriously. We go out, meet the farmers every year, go out to Yakima Valley, we go out um, to Oregon, and we go out in the fields, rub the hops, smell the hops, we pick the hops we want. Um, it's fun, I don't know, it's just a different way of thinking about beer. Absolutely, and it's gotten you plenty of recognition. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and now the dessert beer. Oh yeah, so I can't wait. this is Bite Size, this is new to us this year. We released it a few months ago. Um, find it in shelves around town, um, but the idea is um, instead of a big imperial pastry stout or dessert stout, um, this is like a small version of that. So the same amount of flavors and aromas, but lower alcohol. 
Um, it's kind of like you don't want to eat a whole pie to yourself. Right. You just want a slice. So this is more of like that. Oh, you can, you can drink a can. Perfect. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, that's so lovely. That's rich. Like you said, oh, this is perfect. Yep. A little slice. Exactly. And it's it's made, uh, we, we brew it with a, a plen of tons of wheat malt, the same wheat malt that we put in Dream Yard, and also some barley, some roasted grains, um, some roasted wheat as well. Um, some of our other stouts, which are in this style as well, but they're higher ABV. Those are the ones you want to you wanna share with people. Those are extremely rich. Okay. Um, so this is just kind of, this, the, the more sessional version. Yes, I'll, I'll definitely take this slice for myself. <laughs> Should we see if anybody in the back wants to have a beer with us? Yeah, let's okay. go check it out. All right, let's see. This is great. I love this one. So this is Modest. We are located in the very hip taproom area of the North Loop. Experimentation is key here. Modification and moderation. And using their mash filter, they're able to cut way down on the amount of ingredients it takes to make their product. If science is nerdy, being a beer nerd comes with the territory here, and there's a lot more science to beer making than we thought. This place just takes it up a couple notches. Nerd or no, there's definitely a place at the bar for everyone in this beer community. It's funny to think that a few homebrew kits sold to a small community of homebrewers a couple decades ago would eventually lead to this multi-billion dollar industry. It's that labor of love, or really leisure of love, for soaking up the suds in new and creative ways that drives the evolution of the craft. 